Welcome to this uh, lecture, part of the course Networked and Low Power Embedded Systems. Today we have a distinguished lecture or special lecture because we have a special speaker, uh, Professor Olga Sauk from TU Graz. Um, she will be talking about embedded machine learning, her area of expertise in recent years. And after the lecture, she will also give a hands on lab. So we're all looking forward to your lecture, and yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, introducing me. Can you hear me well? Everything works? Okay, perfect. So um, thank you for the invitation and for this very kind introduction. So I'm Olga, uh, Olga Sauch, I'm, uh, and today I will be giving a lecture empowering edge devices with TinyML. Um, there are two parts, right? There is a lecture and there is a tutorial. Tutorial will be indeed focused uh, deeply on uh, TinyML. Lecture gives a broader overview. You can see here a QR code and this tiny URL uh, shortcut. If you want to follow, basically access the slides and later you will also need it for the exercises, uh, for the, for the um, uh, practical part. So you can already right now basically notice it. Uh, uh, I will show on the slides this link and this QR code a couple of times, but that you know what this is. So let me start um, by introducing a little bit myself. Um, I'm a group leader, embedded learning and sensing systems group, and uh, an associate professor at TU Graz. I'm also with the uh, Complexity Science Hub Vienna, and I lead there a group of six people, six PhD students and myself, plus uh, master students, uh, bachelor students, and so on. Um, also, we have visitors, research visitors, internship uh, students. Uh, this is the QR code to our group if you want to a little bit know more. Uh, my background, uh, basically I studied in Ukraine, in Kiev, 20 years ago already. That makes me old, I know. Um, I studied applied mathematics, uh, then I moved to Germany to study applied computer science at the University of Freiburg. Um, I started my PhD in Stuttgart and then finished in Bonn in computer science. Then I moved to Zurich. Uh, I was a postdoc at ETH Zurich in the, um, uh, in the uh, compu computer engineering yeah, group, right, and networks lab. Uh, this is what I actually was looking for. Um, and after that, after a short excursion to the industry, I started as assistant professor and uh, later as associate professor at TU Graz. Um, right, I usually start my lecture by showing this picture, uh, this slide, uh, just to a little bit to warm up. I used to work on a project called Diffodary, where we embedded basically a device into the cow, got the data, and tried to analyze this data to do early prediction of uh, basically disease. Um, you can probably imagine that replacing batteries in this setup is just a no-go, right? The device should work for uh, four years. It was really interesting project. We were not those who were actually fitting cows with this. So there was a company behind this, basically producing this device. We were working with the data. But what I can provide you with a couple of details. You look at the battery, right? So the battery should really handle quite some work uh, over these uh, four years. And you can see it's split in three sections. So there are three major tasks uh, that are running, basically being executed by the system. What do you think these tasks are? You can see that over the lifespan, so one task consumes around 10 to 25% of the battery, the other task 50 to 80%, and uh, the last task again 10 to 25%. So let's start with the kind of most uh, battery consuming, energy consuming task. Yes. Of course. Uh, so the most battery consuming task is indeed communication. And over these four years, you can imagine that the system sends around 10 megabytes of data. Now, what are the other two tasks? What do you think? Yes? Uh, so one of these is sensing and computation combined. <laughs> and what is the last one? What do you think? Yes. Sleeping. Yes, exactly. So standby, sleeping, basically. It consumes again 10 to 25%. Now talking about tiny ML, right? So imagine first of all, how much data can you really sample over this lifetime, you know, spending still 10 to 25% of the battery, you can sample actually up to one to 10 gigabytes. You can send 
around 10 megabytes. So we have three orders of magnitude difference. Right now, we should be really smart about how we compress the data, right? Uh, well, what is usually being done? You send an average, right? Um, the question is, is it smart enough, right? Is it good enough, an average, right? Uh, just one value representing an average. Can you uh, maybe detect uh, metabolic dysfunction of a cow? Well, maybe, right? But it's very hard to read it from a simple average over uh, quite a long period of time. So this is where we need to be smart about how we compress this data. What do we send, right? What local processing do we do? And this is where TinyML kicks in. Um, yeah, so if you look around, there are many applications already that use basically machine learning, right, on device. Um, well, home assistants, who has a home assistant at home? Yeah, great. So the most common, uh, basically, reply that I hear, ich habe dich nicht verstanden, right? So uh, probably I, I have a kid and this is why it's configured in German. Um, yeah. Um, you probably also know applications that try to detect what, you are, what is being said, right? Uh, to measure activities, uh, how many steps did you do, um, right? What type of uh, public, uh, maybe public transportation, transportation did you take? Object recognition, counting, well, whatever, cars, uh, maybe just looking around, detecting objects. Um, security cameras detecting maybe a postman, right? I really like the application. I believe it, it was a Dutch guy who built a model to recognize and let in only his own cat, but not the other cats from the neighborhood. Uh, so I like this one uh, really a lot. You also know unlocking your phone, right, with, with, with your face, uh, face ID. So many applications out there. And what makes it possible, actually, these all applications is a really success of deep learning, so progress on machine learning over the last, let's say, 10 years, right? And what this plot shows on the x-axis are the years, and on the y-axis is basically classification error. So the best model uh, performance from this year on the ImageNet competition. So ImageNet competition, ImageNet, who doesn't know, I know you may have a very different background, uh, very famous data set, right? A uh, million, uh, more than a million examples, 1,000 classes. Back in 2010, it was considered a really hard classification task, uh, basically, to classify these samples, these pictures correctly. And you can see that, uh, basically, the early methods, they really didn't do well. Uh, they had, like, 25% error which is a lot, right? And then 2012, we have a breakthrough, AlexNet, uh, that could reduce the accuracy down to 16%. Also, industry got really interested. For example, the uh, winner of 2014's competition is GoogleNet, so from Google. The winner of 2015's competition uh, comes from Microsoft Research, which is ResNet, and so on. So a lot of money was also invested into making progress on these tasks. And you can see, well, this statement should be uh, taken with a grain of salt that human error basically is by 6%, right? You'll return to this basically statement a bit later. Um, and you see that uh, basically these methods, these models surpass human, human error, right? They are better. Again, take it with a grain of salt, but I believe for the motivation it's fine. And this progress actually motivated us to think that we can do really well, uh, also on more uh, performance critical or uh, safety critical tasks. Uh, Jeff Dean, the uh, head of Google AI, nicely formulated the trend that was 2016. So to get better results, right, what do we need? We need more data, uh, we need bigger models and more computation, more compute. And actually, this is known also today as the bigger is better trend in terms of model parameters, uh, for example. So safety critical applications, right, what are these? Automotive, robotics, healthcare, right? We actually got really uh, to believe that we can also use machine learning to get much more precision, quality, safety right there. Um, so in, in, in these domains as well. Um, so we, we try to go beyond the simple classification, right? Simple kind of detection of uh, what is in the image that, well, if you, have, you do a classification, it doesn't matter. Here it matters a lot, 
right? And there are two problems here. One is we need to really run uh, inference. We need to uh, basically do uh, so execute these models on the edge. Uh, so real-time execution under resource constraints is important. And the other aspect is trustworthiness, right? So dependability, explainability, safety, um, robustness, adaptation if uh, the situation changes, right? Fairness, so if there are biases, we need to know and counteract, right, and so on. So the belief is that society will increasingly depend on these smart objects and uh, dependability and trust are keys to their societal uh, acceptance. I already mentioned these interesting, really hard applications reside on the, uh, on the end, right, on this uh, edge of uh, edge cloud continuum. So what we have here is on the one hand, intelligent and flexible cloud, right, uh, high performance computing infrastructure. On the other hand, uh, so on the, um, on the left, what do we have? Internet of Things, low power systems, mobile computing. Actually, the focus of also this lecture and, and, and the focus of my work so is here. But you see, I don't really make a cut. I don't focus precisely on low power systems because it's a continuum, right? So the more you move to the left, basically, the more resource constraints, uh, constrained you are. Uh, of course, but we also look into, so the methods that we develop could also be helpful for mobile computing, Internet of Things, slow power systems, so everything that is basically on the edge. Okay. So the first question we should ask ourselves, why, why do we want this, right? Why AI on the edge? And you will be surprised, the first number one reason is not even the the power consumption or latency or privacy, but cost. It's super expensive to run all these inferences in the cloud. It's just super expensive. It costs a lot of money. It's very difficult to explain, you know, if you are starting, you have this great idea, an app that would revolutionize, I don't know, save the world, right? But if your app, you basically, your model relies or has to be executed somewhere in the cloud, you have to somehow make it clear to your customers that, ah, you know, we also have to pay the cloud service providers because, you know, it's heavy computation. You see, you see my problem or you see the point, right? So number one is actually cost. There are more, right? Network bandwidths, especially if this is a smart car and you want really to optimize for operations for real timeliness. Network coverage, not everywhere in the mountains. So, you know, there are regions that are not that well covered. So you do want your app or your, your service to basically run uh, at all times, right? And not just break because there is no internet connection. Power consumption, definitely a reason. Uh, latency, I mentioned privacy. Definitely you don't want the data to be sent right to the cloud or somewhere else. You want it to be processed where it is generated locally. Um, there are also tons of data, IoT data. How many sensors do you have in your phone? Who knows? Who can estimate? Give me a number. Probably more. Uh, there is an app to install just to list all the ses sensors. Uh, you can see that you have actually to scroll. Some of them are virtual, but, but still, it's quite a long list. It's more than 20. Um, so you have tons of data, right, being generated here and locally. Um, so you want definitely to make use of this data also locally. There are a couple of applications uh, that are application domains that are uh, implementable or the, the, where the uh, tiny model brings a lot of value. One is uh, kind of processing vibration and motion data, for example, um, predictive maintenance, activity recognition, right, stuff like this. The, um, uh, second class is voice and uh, sound data. So what is it? Keyword spotting, right? Hey Google. Uh, the third one is vision, so images and uh, video, right? Videos, uh, for example, object detection. What do I have there? Uh, object classification and so on. So there are there is quite a spectrum, and usually tiny ML refers to uh, on-device machine learning applications in a single or a few milliwatt and below. Okay, so this is kind of the definition um, of tiny ML. Now, why not to run uh, 
Dynamo on the or AI on the edge. So one aspect is edge devices are really resource constrained um, and ML is computationally intensive. The other aspect is ML is not robust, right? Adaptive or explainable, dependable, safe, fair. So it may ca cause harm. And we need to look into this problem really in much more detail. Okay, so looking at these pros and cons, right? What are the trends? Because this is important. Uh, this makes us somehow think well, what to focus on, what are, where there are the real problems. So the trend is we get more capable microcontrollers, which is good. Good for basically dreaming that we really have uh, a little bit more and more uh, processing power to do something, right, on these resource-constrained devices. The other one is progress in machine learning. And a lot of aspects in this lecture, we will indeed focus on um, optimization, so on some, uh, basically, techniques that could make our life better when executing a model on the edge. And uh, hardware algorithm co-design. Again, I will come to this question a little bit lecture, uh, a little bit later as part of this lecture. So what we will cover today, we will start with deep learning 101, just for those who has really no background, to be able to follow to understand what we are talking about. It's definitely not the introduction to deep learning that is somehow, well, it's impossible to do it, right? It was in one lecture, like within five minutes. Uh, but it should be sufficient background to understand what we are focusing on, what is the, the main problem. And all the rest uh, until the end of the lecture will be something like a quest, right? A, a kind of a mining challenge. Let's see where we can, how we can optimize, right? What is possible at different levels? Um, how can we really bring an expensive, computationally expensive, and storage expensive machine learning model on device? What, is, what, is, what are the optimization that is possible? And at the very end, I will come to the data problem and explain what it is. So it has to do with this challenge of trustworthiness, robustness, right? And how do we go about it? So in the beginning, you see two colors. Uh, there will be a short summary, kind of summarizing the, the first part, and then there will be the second part. So deep learning 101. Um, I believe everyone kind of saw already deep neural network, right? There are layers. There is an input layer. There are here in the example two hidden layers. There is an output layer. And uh, how do you do inference? This is super easy, right? Uh, let me just get the... Yeah. So this is what you are doing, right? So to compute the... Am I here? No. So uh, to compute the pre-activations, right? You just take the, your input, so this is zero, 01, right? Your input, and you multiply it by the weights. What are the weights? So all these connections, this is basically a matrix, right? Um, so you multiply it by this matrix, right? You can add a bias, but uh, I don't have it in the picture. So you get the pre-activation. Uh, what do you do with it? You apply a nonlinearity. There are different types of, of nonlinearities. Here I use ReLU. ReLU gets an input. If it is positive, then it returns this exactly this uh, this input as output. If it is negative, it just uh, zeroes it out. So it returns zero. This is the ReLU, right? Uh, with this, you get post activations, and basically these serve as input to the next layer, right? So here, and again, you have a uh, weight matrix. Uh, again, you do basically the same. You can see it here, right? And in the third layer, I do also the same, but here I apply the softmax because let's say I have three classes and I want just to know what is the probability, where, which class has the highest probability. Once I have done this, so this process is called inference, these computations, right? Uh, I compute the loss and basically if I want to do training, I do the forward path, computation of the loss, the backward path, which is basically computation of the gradients, and then I can use these gradients to update the weights. And this is learning, right? Now, I believe at this level, so this is a dense network, it's not the, my goal to somehow uh, show you the variety of different network architectures. That would be more or less sufficient to understand what, where I'm going with this. Now is the question to you. What are the DNN performance critical operations? So I explained the inference path, uh, so it should be uh, actually more or less clear what I'm talking about. 
Do you have a guess? Look at basically what we are doing. Yes? Exactly, exactly. So what I do is a lot of metrics multiplication. You see adding a bias, well, not that expensive. Uh, ReLU operation, I explained it's super simple, right? Not that expensive, actually. The most expensive operation here is indeed matrix multiplication. Uh, you can see here, it's a little bit explicitly. So the first part, right, the computation. So I take the input, I basically uh, multiply it by the weight matrix, and I apply a bias to get the output, right? So the first equation or pair of equations that I had on the top. Now, what do you do in the next layer? It's the same. If you are, we are not talking about uh, latency sensitive operations, we can optimize. Uh, what we could do is uh, for training or for latency insensitive operations, we could work not just on one sample of the data, right, on one image, but on a batch. And that would mean that here we have not just one vector, but a matrix, right? And we have here and here matrices, so we are talking about matrix, matrix multiplication, right? Um, okay, so far so good. What can we have here? We could have some sparse matrix, actually. And by sparsity, I mean that some elements are zero in that weight matrix. Uh, we will talk about sparsity a little bit later, but at the current point, it's just important to realize, first of all, it allows for some optimizations, but only if sparsity is kind of sufficient to care about this sparsity. If there is just one zero element somewhere in the matrix, you know, how would you proceed? Would you check all the elements every time? Is it a zero? Do I have to do this multiplication? Definitely not, right? So, if there is just one or a couple of zeros, we don't care. We need a substantial number of zeros to start caring about sparsity. But yeah, in this case, we could apply sparse matrix, matrix, matrix multiplication. Now, what do we do on the back, back, for, back propagation, on the backward pass? Actually, it's also propagation. I put some formulas. We don't have to go through this so, or to understand this. Uh, just computation uh, that happens on the backward pass. But for you, it should be clear uh, from looking just at these equations, there are many matrix matrix multiplications here as well. may say, but wait a moment, this is a super simple architecture, this is dense, uh, fully connected layers, so, you know, what about convolutions, right? Same story. Basically, you can see here the convolution operator be being applied, and you can still see that it's a matrix, matrix multiplication going on, right? And I just took a, a very simple uh, architecture that has two convolutional layers, uh, which is called the uh, Lenet, Lenet 5. Um, yeah, it, so convolutions is also matrix matrix multiplication. Actually, transformers, the basic operation is the same. And here, unfortunately, the, the image quality is not super great. I couldn't find it in better resolution from ARM. They analyze like basic architectures that are often used on the edge because they are just small. And you can see the proportion of uh, this S gem operations, so which is matrix matrix multiplication. So if we want to speed up things, right, we need to take care about this operation for sure. This bring the, uh, brings us to the kind of the first part on hardware optimizations. So what can hardware offer us, right? Can it be supportive with what we are trying to do? Let's take a look. So first of all, a reminder from the computer architecture class, right? Uh, we are talking about load store von Neumann architecture. Right, so we have to deal with it. Um, this is a super simple uh, right graph showing, well, we have the memory, we have a cache, uh, instruction cache, hopefully also data cache. Uh, we have the control unit, we have registers, and we have the ALUL unit. Now, um, who can remind me if we want to add two numbers, so just A plus B equals to X, how do we go about it in this load store of an Neumann architecture? Okay. Uh, let me give you the answer immediately. So you don't, don't just call the ALU and tell, hey, multiple, uh, add, add two numbers, right? So you first have to load actually A and B from the memory, which means first you need the load instruction, right? To understand that this is a load instruction, pick the number from the memory and move it to the register for A and then for B. And only then 
you instruct the ALU unit to actually add these two numbers. The result you get in the register, and now you call the store instruction, right, to store it back to the memory. So this is the load store architecture, right? Um, okay, so it's a general purpose kind of uh, architecture, right? It's a general purpose computer that I'm talking about here. Now, here I have a very curious, uh, basically, uh, graph showing instruction energy break breakdown. So you can see just this add from the 70 picojoules, but just a tiny little fraction. Most of it, well, most of energy you spend actually on iCache access, register file access, setting up control. So you see that basically it's not really made, you know, for fast computation, especially matrix matrix multiplies. On the top, you also have some uh, curious table. So take a closer look into this. Uh, you have integer, floating point, and memory, right, operations, and how much basically you spend on each of these operations. And first of all, try to compare uh, floating point and integer adds, right, what do we see here? Like one order of magnitude around that, maybe a little bit less, but about that difference, right? Uh, now between add and multiply, what do we have? We have again something around one order of magnitude, right, even more. Uh, if you look here, here a little bit less, I believe. And of course, it's uh, ages away from uh, what you spend for memory access, right? So the bottleneck is also called von Neumann bottleneck that you have to every time, you know, load and then you store the intermediate result before you actually uh, load the next instruction and you get it processed and again you store the intermediate result. Um, so I hope I could remind you basically of the basics, right? That, uh, what we are working on, uh, what we are talking about. And now back to our uh, matrix matrix multiplications. Um, so on a CPU, right? General purpose uh, kind of computer, um, you, you work with scalars. So this addition, right, to multiplication that I described, it really focus, uh, it, it really works like this. You have first to load, then you do the operation, then you store the result, you load the next one. So it's really not made for, uh, for deep learning or for matrix matrix multiplications. It's not really supporting. Now, what are the other options? One option, the middle one, right, is the GPUs. And you can see already there, they work with vectors. And also the caches or the memory organization is different just to support vector operations and no more scalars. And uh, the third column that I have are TPUs um, that work, actually uh, TPU from Google, it works on matrices, which is super convenient. So it really tries to speed up this basic operation. And you also see that memory uh, organization is nothing like a CPU, right? There are substantial differences. Let's take a look into uh, how TPU works a little bit in more detail. So what you can see here is a diagram. Basically, here you have the um, where the data uh, basically is loaded. Here you have the weight FIFO. And here you have nothing else than a systolic array. And the advantage is that you don't really uh, store the intermediate output of the operations, right? So you basically, the output of the partial multiplication goes, so adds up to the output of the next one and so on. So this is basically an architecture that supports really this matrix matrix uh, multiplication uh, really efficiently. Um, very important point, TPU is an ASIC. So what it do does is really optimize matrix matrix multiplication. You can also see it does more optimizations. Here you see the accumulators, activation that you can immediately apply, uh, normalization, pooling layers, so you can do stuff basically one after the other without flushing everything back to memory, without uh, storing the intermediate result. Here uh, is just a short plot uh, or a small plot by Google published in a, in a blog post showing that their TPUs uh, really rock. Uh, this is from 2017. Uh, that, may, that made uh, NVIDIA a little bit unhappy, so they replied with their blog post comparing their GPUs with uh, TPU. And what you can see, so indeed the power consumption of a TPU is much lower, uh, but the bandwidth for the data access for GPUs is much higher. So there are some tra trade-offs involved, right, if you look at different optimization metrics. Um, 
Also, there is an edge TPU that consumes only two uh, milliwatt of uh, uh, power, and um, this is really optimized for only inference, so not training, but for inference for edge applications. So that seems supposed to be. Ah, okay, I accidentally clicked on the link. Okay, so this is the device that we'll be, we will be using in the, in the lab today. So Arduino Nano 33B Lisense, why I'm showing it here, I'm it's an uh, embedded device, right? Do it yourself for different projects. And I would like to look, what does it offer to support actually computation on the edge? Um, first of all, from the hardware point of view, single cycle Mac uh, instruction meaning that you can multiply and add so and accumulate in one uh, single cycle. It also offers 8 and 16-bit SIMD instructions, so single instru instruction multiple data, right, to parallelize uh, a little bit, a little bit computation. A single precision floating point unit. For most applications, we will see uh, you, you go pretty far with integers, with quantization. Sometimes you do need uh, to good precision, and uh, this is where you need floating point um, operations. Hardware divide. What is even more important uh, at the software level, it offers uh, Cortex microcontroller software interface standard. So this is a library which basically uses this hardware or provides the implementation of basic operations, for example, matrix matrix multiplication on this hardware. So it's optimized precisely for this hardware. Um, and you can see here uh, also it provides the extension uh, CMC's NN uh, software library, which implements it, it is uh, based on the CMC's uh, basic uh, basis, basis uh, library and it implements uh, deep learning specific operations, uh, uh, such as convolutions, activation functions that are common in deep learning and so on. So this is already kind of provided as a basic a software library that knows how to use this hardware efficiently. Um, you can also see here uh, the TensorFlow Lite Micro officially supports this platform. And it builds, it uses actually these libraries to um, basically provide good performance of machine learning models on this hardware. Compatibility problem. So there are many companies that try to really optimize hardware for deep learning uh, because deep learning is so popular and there are so many applications, especially on the edge. There is actually a race, right? Who gets basically better results, uh, who, gave, who offers the best hardware for which type of applications and so on. Um, established companies are involved, for example, Google with its uh, edge TPU, TPU, right? Uh, there are also startups. Uh, however, a framework to run on a piece of, hard of hardware, uh, for a framework to, to run on a piece of hardware, it has to be supported by the hardware vendor, which means there should be a library which somehow knows how to use this hardware efficiently. Right? And there is a very uh, interesting example. So TPUs were publicly released by Google in February uh, 2018. And it took actually one and a half years for PyTorch, which was uh, and is remains basically a very popular framework for uh, training deep, uh, deep models uh, and uh, was developed by Meta, not Google, right, uh, to support um, to be supported on TPUs. So basically, if you want to, you know, use TPUs, if you want to run your code there, well, you have to program TensorFlow because this comes from Google and PyTorch doesn't, it's from Meta. So there is a competition, you can see it, right? Um, interesting, also as part of my course, I do this experiment with my students since we use Google infrastructure. We also test how efficient if you implement basic operations in PyTorch and TensorFlow and execute on Google infrastructure, you can always see the difference. Uh, with TensorFlow, you're fast. It's competition, right? <laughs> so I believe this is uh, kind of obvious. Okay, so let me come to ML compilers. So at the hardware level, I hope it is clear what we have and what are different uh, options. Um, what are ML compilers, first of all? It is uh, taken, so the, um, um, the word is taken from, well, uh, compilations, compilers, such as uh, GCC, right? Uh, but applied in this deep learning context. And what is the problem here? 
The problem is that you want to take any model, right, and written in any framework, basically it could be PyTorch, it could be TensorFlow or JAX, it could be something else. Um, and you want to execute it efficiently on a particular hardware. How do you do this, right? How do you kind of bridge the gap, right? Um, you can see then different options for frameworks and models, especially gross. Um, 10 years ago, the, the times of AlexNet, the models were, you know, uh, smaller, right? They were not that different, actually. But now you have loops, you have uh, if conditions. So it's really, really a zoo of models. And it's growing, right? So people are coming with new optimization hacks and, uh, you know, what can you do? How can you better somehow do, do operations there? Um, and on the other hand, we also have a variety of hardware. And it's again growing, right? Where would you like to uh, run your model? Here. Uh, there is also another problem that the model developers, right, they are actually uh, not hardware architects. They care about data and what is basically, you know, how, um, uh, which features they ex extract from a model. Um, they care about basically data and operations on this uh, data. They care about what this, their models represent. They really don't care about where this will run and whether it is kind of optimized for this platform and whether they have sufficient support. Of course, you may say, but wait a moment, if you want kind of uh, to run uh, deep learning on, on this hardware, right? Uh, well, there should be an instruction set to support us, right? To just, you, you use that and, and uh, you know, magic happens. They all offer these instructions and then we can use this and, you know, here you go, you're done. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, Hoyle Crea uh, uh, calls um, uh, specialization right is just too large. Uh, there are so many options to optimize for in the hardware that it's a competition. So the companies are really competing uh, with each other. There will never be uh, just a you know standardized set of instructions because that would be you know against this specialization kind of trend. Um, so this is why we want really a compiler, right? To do nothing else than take your model, taking uh, written in a framework, let's say PyTorch or anyone, uh, any framework you like, and basically make it a deployable code on a target platform. And what is this? So, in contrast to regular compilers, right, where at the end you have the code that runs natively on the device, um, here we have usually the model description and an engine to efficiently run this model on the device. And you can see the process, the transformation process or m machine learning compilation uh, goes like this. So first, uh, the, your model of interest is uh, basically transferred into or transformed into high level intermediate representation, which is hardware agnostic. So this is a computation graph uh, from this one we uh, transfer it into a low-level intermediate representation, which is framework agnostic, okay? And in the, uh, this transition is uh, also, there are quite many optimizations that can be done uh, at this transition. And this from low-level, then you generate the code or the model description plus the engine, how to run it on the device. Um, so let's take a look uh, what are these optimizations? How does it work, right? So first of all, integration and dependency mi minimization, uh, which means when you compare development and deployment environments. In the development environment, you have a model, all the functions that you would like to use or may potentially use at your fingertips, right? So there are, uh, there are libraries providing you full support. At the deployment side, uh, side, you would like to minimize these dependencies. There may be libraries from different vendors that you would like to consolidate. And you keep only functionality that uh, you really need on that device. For example, if your model does, I don't know, flower classification, probably it doesn't need functions that re are related to natural language processing. So these you remove, right? You keep really only the set that you need uh, basically on the device. So this is one aspect. The other aspect are this, this transition between high-level and low-level representation, you do many optimizations. 
Some optimizations that you may see here, you recognize from compilers lecture, actually. For example, constant folding, right? Some expressions can be evaluated at compile time. Definitely you do this. Um, Non-zero or removing uh, no ops or zero dimension tensors. Uh, this is, I believe, also a no-brainer. Uh, if possible, then you remove this. Um, operator fusion, I will give an example on the next slides. Um, what else do we have here? Dead code elimination, you should also know from compilers, lectures, right? Layout transformation, what this means is, um, for example, you probably know convolution, right? Takes an as input a 4D tensor, which is, uh, the, so the dimensions are the batch size, uh, the number of channels, uh, height and width of your filters. And basically this channel, uh, number of channels, it could be on the second position or on the last position. And basically depending on the operations that you do, you can optimize for caches, for cache performance. And this is why you may want to do this layout transformations. Um, there are also optimizations like sometimes uh, you multiply by one that could be removed, or you multiply a matrix by an identity matrix. If this is kind of known, you can also eliminate this because you know the results. So there are also mathematical, at least obvious uh, transformations or known transformations that are being performed here as well. So what is a computation graph? Just to give you a couple of examples of a little bit more sophisticated and more kind of machine learning specific uh, transformations. So here is an example, a super simple one. Uh, we start with an Input tensor, right? Yeah, uh, we start with an input tensor, right? We have our weights here, um, and you see the nodes of these graphs uh, graph are uh, operators, right? Uh, operations. Uh, so here is linear. Linear is just matrix vector multiplication, or matrix matrix multiplication. But here we have a batch size of one, so it's matrix vector, vector multiplication. You get the output. You apply nonlinearity again. Relu uh, from our example, you get the output, and now this is the next layer, right? Again, you have the weights, uh, you do the multiplication, you apply the softmax. So this is a super simple example, right? Uh, which is consistent also uh, with the examples I showed before. Now, what can you do to optimize the execution of this graph? One thing is to use specialized tensor functions for a particular architecture. Here you can see we have an add of a bias term, right, uh, which looks uh, basically like this. This is a very general function. But if your hardware support actually uh, vectorized um, implementation, you can see here you split, you basically proceed in chunks of four, right, and you do uh, basically this addition in parallel. This is definitely a function that won't work on every hardware, right, organization, but if this hardware that you are targeting supports this, then you can use the specialized function. Um, I hope this is, this is clear. So this allows you to do all this optimization for caches, parallelization, vectorization, and so on. Another example is operator fusion. Again, our um, uh, computation graph, and here you can see what we can do is, for example, to fuse these two operators. Why does it make sense? So since these two operators are separated, right, in this graph, what happens is basically you loop over the, uh, the batch size, you loop over the, uh, the, the uh, number of uh, output uh, neurons, and uh, what you do then is you basically multiply the, uh, your input by the, by the weights, right? Um, so once you have done this, you apply the nonlinearity. So you loop again, to just apply the nonlinearity. Obviously, these two operations can be fused together to loop basically only once. And this is what you can see here. Um, so you have here, you loop over the uh, batch sizes one, I mentioned this. So over the batches, uh, you or over the, uh, the samples in the batch, you loop over the output, you have 200 uh, basically neurons as, as an output. You can see here, so you initialize the, because you multiply and accumulate, right? So the summation was zero. And now you loop um, over the, sum, uh, the um, uh, dimension of your input sample, and you can see you multiply it by the weight, right? And here immediately at the end of this loop, you can apply the prelude nonlinearity. So you can really fuse the operations. And uh, there are very common patterns where operator fusion 
actually makes a lot of sense. For example, 2D convolutions and then add bias activation or convolution fuse batch norm. Uh, why fuse? Because it's also actually a couple of operators, so you can, uh, this can be fused as well, and then activation, matrix multiplication, add a bias, and then activation. So there are common patterns where this optimization is possible. Now, of course, by fusion, you create something like this monolithic or something called monolithic kernels. And now is the question to you, what is the drawback of this approach? Can you think of anything? So this is a good thing, right? So it allows to simplify kind of uh, the amount of computational looping, unnecessary basically looping, looping twice through the data. What is the drawback? Yes? Not quite. Um, the problem with this is, uh, for example, if you would like to do training, then having these kind of fuse operators is definitely not a good idea, right? So basically, this is an inference-only optimization. Okay. Um, just a very short example at the end of this part uh, um, of an ML compiler, which is Apache TVM. TVM stands for Tensor of Virtual Machine, and I just uh, go through what it does. It takes a model implemented in any framework, it converts it into this computation graph, they call it relay uh, intermediate representation, uh, and then they proceed layer-wise, and for each layer they try to optimize the parameters, how this layer could be executed on the target device. You can see that they generate the binary code, they actually test it, um, they update the cost model, and they loop here to find the best implementation, uh, or the, the best configuration of the parameters. Basically, this is what it does. And once you are happy, sometimes it takes a week, sometimes it, it takes hours, of course you can stop at some point, uh, but basically it provides you the optimized uh, code for the target platform. They also have a, a micro TVM, and micro TVM is particularly targeting really edge devices, uh, because they explain that they are, you usually don't have an operating system, so all things are different, parameters that you optimize are different, this is why it's uh, basically a different story, and they have uh, this micro TVM, and they are really, uh, so it was 2018, uh, they were really um, Proud beating the hand-tuned vendor-provided libraries actually by doing this uh, optimization loop. So it's a little bit uh, goes in the direction AI helps AI, right? Uh, so you use actually learning to uh, efficiently run um, machine learning model on device. Okay, uh, now to wrap up this part. Who knows what is the phenomenon called the hardware lottery? Who has ever heard of it? Okay. Um, so basically, despite the belief that somehow uh, this success, or we can reason about success and failure of machine learning models, of algorithm in general, in isolation, the history shows this is not the case. So basically, for a um, breakthrough, like AlexNet, right, to really become successful, you need a basically that there are no kind of no single failure case in the downstream software and hardware. So you need alignment of how hardware works, how lower level software works to have really, you know, a success story. If hardware doesn't support the sparsity pattern that you are trying to push into, you know, your model for optimization, you won't get anything optimized. This is what I'm talking about. So it must win the hardware lottery. If you don't know this paper, uh, the hardware lottery, I truly recommend it. It's an easy read, but a really very interesting one. Uh, take a look at it. Uh, this is why I shared the slides so that you can click, uh, click on the link. And the history knows many examples where basically there was a delayed recognition of ideas that unfortunately due to uh, precisely this problem. So the 
downstream performance hardware software was not possible, was not on, on the at the level that was required for the idea to, uh, to succeed. One example, quite early example, is this analytical, uh, analytical engine uh, by, designed by Charles uh, Babash in uh, 1837. 1837, Turing was born 1912, if I'm not mistaken. So he designed more or less an, a, an analytical engine, the, uh, engine that was capable to execute any computation. But it was never built because technology didn't allow to build parts at the required precision. And uh, basically this technology appeared after the Second World War, much later, right? And this is not the only example. If you think about AI winter, right? So a delayed recognition of deep learning as a promising research direction. Again, why? Well, because CPUs were really terribly uh, terrible for matrix multiplications, right? So they were just ill-suited for this due to Von Neumann bottleneck. We know this as well, right? Uh, today, we are actually uh, having this pendulum backswing, right, towards specialized architectures, so computer architectures, which is great. And um, uh, this uh, uh, trend is actually supported by uh, the end of Moore's law, right, the breakdown of uh, Denard scaling, the uh, this bigger is better trend in the number of uh, uh, model parameters in deep learning, the rising energy course, uh, costs, and also the uh, requirement right to deploy uh, basically machine learning on the edge on resource constrained devices so this all together actually right now pushes the hardware engineers system people right uh, embedded systems people and machine learning to work together to at least to try to understand each other uh, to make progress basically to counteract these trends uh, one more example very recent one is uh, regarding sparsity i mentioned this that well, there are really clever uh, ways to optimize the space requirement, the execution speed for, uh, of deep learning models by using sparsity. But unfortunately, it's very uh, hard to get this speed from the current hardware because it's really not, it doesn't support sparsity. Okay. And there are some developments I will mention. I have one slide on this a little bit later in the second part of the, of the talk, but I hope you uh, kind of understood what I'm, I was trying to say. Okay, so I suggest I just move to the second part without a break. And I would like to talk about the now the software part of matrix matrix multiplication, right? Um, so it is, right? The, the classical problem. Um, just to be on the same page, everyone knows how to multiply matrices, right? Uh, just a reminder to be again on the same page because probably high school was a couple of years back. So you have the raw I, right? You multiply by column J and you proceed element wise, right? Usually, and uh, you see you accumulate basically the result to get this one element or the, the result one element CIJ. Um, a minor remark you have here matrix A. Uh, m by n and b n by m and we know that these dimensions have to agree right so sometimes we just shorten this and write that uh, we multiply a by b and the dimensions uh, are m comma n comma p so basically just to you know because these two have to agree anyways okay so how would you multiply matrices uh, probably you think uh, why are you asking this basic question right um, the naive implementation is three loops, right? So you loop over I, over J, over K, and you do the accumulation. Super easy. Um, what is the time complexity, just uh, uh, the algorithmic complexity of this? You need, actually, you can see three loops, and in every loop you do multiplication, so it's n cube, right, in terms of multiplies, and you accumulate every time, but since you somehow don't accumulate in initially, so you start with zero, so you accumulate actually um, basically n cubed minus, uh, minus n square. And this, is, this gives you the computational complexity of the, this name implementation, three loop matrix, matrix multiplication. So all of uh, three cube. For two times two matrices, it's eight multiplies and four adds. Uh, you can believe me that this is correct, right? 
And just to mention, in case someone may think, but wait a moment, there is another way, for example, using divide and conqueror, uh, like you can split each matrix, it could be huge, right, into kind of uh, two by two sub matrices, and you do the multiplication basically recursively, right, and then you uh, compute the results like um, the, the standard two by two matrix multiplication. So this also exists, of course, there, there is an overhead of this recursion, right, of allocating stack frames and basically calling functions, setting parameters, we, we all know this, but just, just to mention. And now is the question to you, can we do better? And probably at this point you think, okay, I have never heard of it, uh, whether we can do better, but since Olga is asking this question, apparently there is something to say at least, uh, right, about this. There is a Strassen algorithm, which is super interesting, at least to know about. Um, it does matrix-matrix multiplication for two by two matrices, and it uses basically only seven recursive calls. So seven times calling multiply, but 18 times adds. And remember again the table where we compared, you know, the energy overhead of add and multiply, just, just to call this kind of in your memory, uh, why basically we are so much caring about multiplies, because they're more expensive, right? And here you can see basically the algorithm, um, so you compute these seven values, for every value there is only one multiply everywhere, so these are your seven multiplies, and then this is how you construct the final result. You can try this at home, you can try to understand how to come up with this formula, and just after some time to realize it's extremely not straightforward. It's not clear how Strassen actually came with this idea, because it's really very non straightforward. Uh, before him, everyone believes you can't do better than n cube. Um, so not possible. So he showed it is possible, um, and it solves a fundamental problem. Again, we are talking about general kind of dense matrix matrix multiplication. For sparse matrices, we have a separate uh, uh, set of approaches. The biggest problem of this approach is that um, the um, uh, limited precision of non-integer values. So it has higher, basically, uh, error that you get through this computation. Um, also, if you compare this number, right, of operations to our two times n cubed minus two, so when is it worse computationally to use this algorithm? And it comes out that for matrices that are larger than 654 uh, 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 in size. So actually large matrices. But what is interesting, it inspired quite some developments, and uh, you can see people really tried to push this limit even further down. And you can see even last year there was further improvement, although it's a fourth digit of the comma, uh, and we are talking about asymptotic, right, uh, basically uh, improvement. Is it practical? Well, already Strassen algorithm doesn't seem to be very practical, so practical code still uses n cube uh, operations, so it's still three loops. But it's interesting that you can't really do better than squared. Why? Because you need to touch matrix element at least once, and it's n by n matrix, so it's n squared, right? And uh, you can do better than uh, n cube. Um, I would like also to mention that uh, there is also, again, AI helping AI, right? Um, so the developers of AlphaGo, AlphaGo was in the news, I believe, very prominently, right? Uh, so the solver for the kind of uh, the uh, Go game, right, which is super complex. Um, so the same developers from DeepMind also came up with Alpha Tensor, where they try to help, basically, to find this decomposition, how to uh, add uh, how to multiply matrices with fewer multiply operations. And what you can see here, this is the size of the matrices. Again, remember n, m, and p because this inner di dimension has to agree. And you can see from two by two matrices, three by three, four by four, to many more kind of configurations. Uh, why do we care? Because if we can optimize any of these, then for larger matrices, basically we apply something like divide and conqueror, and then we can handle larger matrices as well. So here's the best known rank 
right? And here's the tensor, uh, alpha tensor uh, rank, so the output how many multiply operations. For modular setting, modular setting is for binary matrices and standard settings so for any matrices. And you can see that they could in this basically basic group, right, fundamental group improve from 49 to 47 operations, from 98 here to 96. Remember this value for the ne next slide, it will be relevant. But also they found quite many other, basically for other matrices, quite many optimizations. What is interesting also that they could guide their search, right, uh, so alpha tensor, they could guide uh, their search to optimize for a specific hardware. And they also show this here that on GPU basically the same uh, matrix matrix multiplication, uh, so the, the same algorithm that they found, uh, it has different performance basically depending on the hardware, on the TPU, on the GPU, so they can tune uh, some parameters to uh, get also hardware specific uh, performance. Now, a year, no, not a year, sorry, uh, one week later there was again uh, in the news the breakthrough basically where the uh, mathematician found a better way so to do multiply for, let me go back, this 5x5 five five matrices, so with 95 operations. And this is the most weird actually paper that I have ever seen. If you, can I click it? Let us. Do we have it here? Yes. So this is the paper uh, I was just just to show the most weird paper I have ever seen. So you see the introduction, right? Basically the problem statement, and they are saying uh, we found an algorithm. So this decomposition again, how to uh, do this with 47 multiplication, and here is our solution, right? 47. 47. And for five by five matrices, we do it with 95 multiplication, and here is our solution. Um, Right, so you can you can check it. So we have our solution kind of as, uh, as some file uh, online. So you can check that it indeed uh, correctly multiplies matrices. Here are the references. So we are done. Uh, just in case you don't know how to structure a paper effectively, right? Okay, um, great. No, I hit the wrong button. Yeah, okay. I hope that was uh, interesting also for you to learn that there are quite some developments and interesting results on a fundamental problem that I thought actually two years ago it solved, like probably hundred years, or I don't know, for hundreds of years. So it's not, and you see quite some developments there. Now, let me go to, so since we don't, can't do much actually at the level of matrix matrix multiplication, what can we do at the level of models? And this is where we would like to talk about model compression. Compression is a general term, right? Which means somehow uh, find a way to uh, have the same performance but have a smaller model, right? And there are different types of uh, optimizations that could, uh, could be applied. One is uh, weight on their own pruning, right? And I just here put the diagram where in the brackets, so you see a classification and in the brackets, there are a number of papers published on the topic. And that is for 2021, right? So the, this summary. So you can see how many people are working on this and really uh, pushing different ideas, how to optimize basically these uh, large models, uh, uh, how to shrink their size, how to reduce the number of computations. Usually we are talking about kind of structured sparsity, unstructured sparsity. Unstructured sparsity is not supported by the hardware. So this is, there is uh, a lot to be done in, in this space. Uh, so not only at the level of algorithm, but also at the level of you know, downstream software and hardware. Uh, the second one is, is quantization. I highlighted it because this is something we will do in the lab as well. And uh, this is supported, this is basically the only optimization supported uh, by the TensorFlow Light, uh, Light uh, framework. There are more options like factorization, uh, knowledge distillation, and, and more. Usually different options are also combinable together. Okay, so what is sparsity? Sparsity means that we want to remove some, well, weights. This is, it would be fine-grained or unstructured sparsity. Uh, for example, here, right, we 
uh, remove a couple of uh, connections basically, so we zero out a couple of elements in this matrix. Uh, we could remove neurons, right? In this case, this is already structured sparsity. We could remove also structured sparsity individual layers or convolutional filters. So this is what we, we could do. And this, why does it make sense? So first of all, um, uh, this follows this principle, this is called uh, Ozum, uh, Occam's razor, and you can see what it says, basically, with all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. And there is a similar, basically, statement here regarding the model complexity also made by Einstein. I believe everyone can read, uh, basically, what is written on this slide. Uh, even though 30%, over 30% of letters are missing, so this is sparsity, you can still read it, right? Um, what is important to understand uh, uh, sparsity is structure. So it's not just we removed something and computation are not happening, we are actually introducing a structure to the network, an additional kind of structure. Um, why is it important? If you think in terms of information theory, so you have this one bit of information and it's your choice to where do you invest it. You could invest it in maybe having yet another weight or you could invest it into remembering the structure so that some connection is not there. So zeroing out. Again, this is uh, so uh, zeroing out weights. It's not just, you know, replacing it with zero. It's introduction of uh, structure. And this also means that when you uh, basically train a network, this is also um, a regularization that you are applying. There are many options when talking about pruning, when to prune, how to prune and what to prune. Here I have on the slide a, a, a couple of just options to give you a little bit a better idea that this is really a large space uh, of different options. For example, you can decide to first train a model which is dense, and then you sparsify it. So it's one short post-training uh, sparsification. You can also uh, sparsify the model uh, during training, right, to get a small model at the end, or you could go sparse training, but this is the most hard, actually, option. Uh, usually sparse training doesn't work well. Um, here is the pipeline that I again took from this paper, uh, summarizing sparsity methods that covers kind of different options uh, how to sparsify a model. You start with initializing the structure, uh, then you initialize the weights, right? Um, you train, you prune, and usually you are either in this loop, so you train, you prune, you train, you prune, right? So you kind of gradually reduce the size of the model, or uh, what uh, appear to be also very effective, uh, you ro rewind, so you roll back to initialize, uh, initialization to, to the initial weights, and then you train again from initialization. So basically, you decide to prune something, you take the weights that are left, you roll back to initialization, and you train again. Um, and this uh, appeared to be a very uh, effective method. What is interesting about sparsity is that it doesn't only, with, uh, basically as you increase sparsity, it doesn't only provide you better performance, but you can also see here that the accuracy basically goes up before it basically at very high sparsity drops down. And this going up is basically due to this structure that you introduce uh, by sparsity, by doing sparsity. This I promise to show that there is hardware that supports sparsity, and this is two to four sparsity, uh, uh, supported by NVIDIA Ampere A100 architecture or accelerator uh, that is equipped with sparse tensor cores. So what is N2Ms or two to four sparsity? So two to four sparsity means that from four uh, consecutive weights, only two are allowed to be non-zeros, okay? And you can see here how the transformation goes. So you take four consecutive. These are the highest, so they are capped. The rest is zero out. So you go for the next four and so on. And now you have this representation, right, where you have basically 50% sparsity, so 50% zeros. And you can compress it or represent this as a 
matrix which is dense and contains all these non-zeros and the uh, uh, matrix of binary basically values telling whether the element is here or not. And they basically optimize in hardware operations on this representation of the matrix with just, uh, you know, 50% uh, of uh, values left plus uh, this, this mask, basically what is left out and what is still kept. Um, and this is how they provide performance. Now, model quantization, this is also a very interesting plot. Uh, you can see here the peak power and peak performance. We are interested, of course, in very low power devices, right? And you can see many triangles here that are empty. And uh, you can go here to the legend. Empty means uh, there is support for inference only. And triangles means that you actually usually have only integer operations in contrast to like data center systems where you have support for training and uh, also for floating point operations. Just to give you a little bit an idea where we are and what is supported where. What is model quantization? I believe probably many of you have heard of it. It maps the values from floating points, so uh, 32 floating point usually to a low precision format. Um, a low precision format very often is really integer. 8-bit. And you can see here an example how it's happening. So here we have floating point axis and here we have uh, at the bottom the uh, uh, 0 to 255 which is uh, integer 8-bit. Um, usually so minimum is mapped to the minimum, maximum is mapped to the maximum. If you have here kind of higher values they are mapped to the maximum. Uh, there are a couple of special values that should be mapped exactly to a particular value in the, uh, basically in the uh, quantized domain, and the special value is zero. Zero is special because it is used, for example, for padding. So you can't really use an approximate zero. You need really a clean zero. So this one is mapped directly, but for other uh, values, you usually have a non-exact mapping. So you map to the next closest value, which means if you can dequantize, so if you go back, you have a small error. And uh, this is the formula just representing the uh, uh, scaling factor, you can see here is the range uh, of R, which is the real value, and here's the range of your quantized value. This is the quantized value that, uh, that you get, and this is the zero shift. So what is important also for the lab, you have a scalar and you have a zero shift. These two factors are necessary to, uh, transform, or, or to, to transform a value from real value to quantized domain, and that's it. Now, this is how it is done and also explains why you need extra inf information, not just the model to quantize it. So imagine you give your um, optimizer a model, quantize it. What shall you do with it? It can check the uh, values of the weights and say, oh, well, they fall in this range. I know how to quantize this range, no problem. But now, what would be the input? How that, uh, so that I can also quantize the output? This is where you need actually to provide some input representative data set, just to give an idea in which range the input values fall. Once it has this information, it can also quantize this range, and it knows what the output of the multiplication will be. And uh, it will be, for example, this range, and also this range can be quantized. This is how you can do basically full integer quantization. This is just performance results showing that in terms of model size comparison, quantization is very effective. So this is the orange bars here. Uh, so you have uh, s significant space reduction. In terms of latency, uh, you can see that uh, the reduction is not the same because it also depends on the hardware where you run basically your models. For example, convolutional operation is not very well optimized uh, in contrast to uh, really dense multiplication. And the, in terms of accuracy, you can see sometimes you have a little bit larger uh, kind of uh, gap or uh, quality reduction, but in general quantization is actually quite efficient. Safety and robustness. I will just shortly go through because I'm already two minutes over time, I believe, uh, so through this part just to explain the data problem. Um, so we are talking about uh, neural networks right on the edge. And usually we are used to a setup where you have a temperature sensor and if the value is, let's say, above the, some certain threshold, then, well, your hardware controls and process, maybe it turns off the tap. 
So this is deterministic. We know how to somehow uh, verify such systems. Um, we know what it does. We know also how to debug. If something doesn't work, maybe it's the sensor. Uh, maybe it's the, uh, uh, the uh, we need to verify our software. Maybe it's the tap actually that doesn't go, uh, go off if we close it. Now imagine a situation where you shout basically, stop, and the process has to stop. Again, people who have experience with home assistance know ich habe dich nicht verstanden, right? So that may happen. We are talking about actually a probabilistic kind of uh, output of the model. And this has to be, so you have, you know, was it a stop, was it a goal? And you have the probabilities, class probabilities. Now, which one was this? And it very much depends on the input. And the input is the data, the data your model was trained on, right? So this is precisely the data problem. Usually, you take the data set, you shuffle it, split into test validation, uh, train test validation, and then you train your model. You deploy it, you get what? You don't know what you get, actually. So there is one application where so seismometers were used in the mountains to detect three categories of, of basically, uh, events. Noise, rockfall, and earthquake. And labeling this data requires, a, you know, an expert who understands what this crack or whatsoever is to label this data. So on training set, the model performed 91%. But if you just move the sensor or apply this model to a sensor, deploy it at a different location, you can see that the accuracy falls off a cliff. We also had this very same uh, problem with uh, the, our pollen sensing system where we trained on library data, um, uh, the label by, by the experts, and now uh, we go to the field, we have a distribution shift, which is 30%. It's even more interesting, remember the ImageNet data set? People try 10 years later to use, to recreate the data set. So again, uh, crawl, flicker, apply all the filters that were applied at the, um, uh, at the, for the ImageNet data set and see how robust are the models. Interestingly enough, humans are very robust. So they basically gave this, uh, the same accuracy on both data sets, but not the models. We have here 80% distribution shift. Again, remember I, I told you not to take too seriously this uh, passing the uh, uh, human error, right? Surpassing human error by the models. So you, here you can see it as well. Humans are robust to changes, models are not. There are many approaches um, in the literature. This is a hot topic, how to address this problem. Starting from simple data augmentation, pre-training, adversarial training, going to the main adaptation methods where you try to match basically the features in uh, your, uh, in your uh, target domain and, and your source domain and also on device learning. Um, there is a lot of going on in the field on this. Just to conclude the presentation, I would like to show you three slides where this is all going according to basically what I read and uh, somehow how I think about it. Um, the dominant paradigm is this bigger is better, right? In terms of the model of the number of model parameters. And um, we are now in starting or have started the era foundation models, right? Huge monsters. And usually what you do, you train it on tons of data and then you fine tune on different tasks. Um, large language models is a good example, GPT-3, GPT-4, right? And what is happening is actually this. So, so basically, if you want to get a big model, what do you do? So you basically get, take more data, you take more compute, you throw the previous model away, right? And now you have a bigger model with better and big kind of next generation capabilities. You don't like this, you throw this away, you train a bigger one. So this is basically what we are doing, right? And what I would like to argue is that we would like to break this monolith. And we would like not to have this one huge model, but rather a network kind of of these small or so smaller uh, expert models. Okay, and we need a system to manage these models. So the ecosystem of specialized models that can be continually or continuously improved.
I believe this is where we are going. I will skip the next slide. Uh, I believe this just shows the details that there are trends that go in this direction and just uh, skip to takeaways. So first of all, for the second part, we need to counteract the trend bigger is better. I'm sure of this. Model compression is one direction. A complementary one is thinking about the ecosystem of specialized models and how to use this ecosystem. It's much easier to update and manage and maintain the system. There are already papers that do operations on these expert models. You can combine them into a model that can do both tasks. You can subtract them. So there is an arithmetic actually on these experts. Um, the other one is model adaptation and robustness in the physical world. So to understand the gap between natural and artificial artificial data distributions, because even all these data augmentations and so on, they do not really solve the problem. If you haven't understood yet, what is the role of data distribution? What does it, how does it impact training? How does it impact what we basically, the model robustness in the field? So there is a lot of going on here as well. Adaptation of the ecosystem is also a question. So what if you don't have one model, you have an ecosystem, how to kind of handle this? So what is the system support that, that is required? Uh, the question of guarantees is, uh, is open as for um, uh, so many years ago. There are many hot topics and research questions in this field. With this, I would like to advertise the reading group that I'm uh, basically started to, um, uh, to, it's a public reading group, it's not just uh, my team, uh, to try to get people kind of talk to each other, people from the systems, embedded systems domain, but also from the ML. Um, you can just Google for efficient ML as one word. It should be the first basically link on Google if you're interested. And check the web page and then you will see whether you're interested. Thank you so much.